Introduction to the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia by Sir Philip Sidney. Introduction to the Earl of Derby, K.G., not alone as Prime Minister of England and foremost in the councils of the Queen, but as possessor of a more enduring fame as orator, scholar, and poet. This edition of the chief work of a noble author, noble by birth, more noble in his mind, is fitly and by permission dedicated by the editor. Introductory and Biographical Essay King Henry the Second brought with him from Anjou, in 1154, one William Sidney, who, being knighted for service in battle, had the manor of Sutton granted to him, and was chamberlain to the king. In lineal descent from him was William Sidney, who commanded the right wing of the army victorious at Flodden. He died in 1554, leaving a son, Henry, who was the father of Philip by Lady Mary Dudley. Henry Sidney, a man of comeliness of person, gallantness, and liveliness of spirit, virtue, quality, beauty, and good composition of body, the only odd man and paragon of the court, was, in 1550, knighted in company with William Cecil, afterwards Lord Burley. He was in great favour with the court, and in July 1553 King Edward VI died at Greenwich, after uttering a noble prayer, says Mr. Bourne, which closed with the following words, O my Lord God, defend this realm from papistry, and maintain thy true religion, that I and my people may praise thy holy name. Then he said, I am faint, Lord have mercy upon me, and take my spirit, and looking towards Sir Henry Sidney, fell into his arms, and expired. Of his mother, Sir Philip was as proud as he was of his father. Referring to the Duke of Northumberland in his defence of the Earl of Leicester, Philip wrote, I am a Dudley in blood, that Duke's daughter's son, and do acknowledge, though in all truth I may justly affirm that I am, by my father's side, of ancient and always well-esteemed and well-matched gentry, yet I do acknowledge, I say, that my chiefest honour is to be a Dudley. Of seven children, Philip was the eldest. The second child was Mary, for whom the Arcadia was written, who married Henry Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and dying was celebrated in an ever-living epitaph by Ben Jonson, as Sidney's sister, Pembroke's mother. On the death of King Edward, Sir Henry had retired to Penshurst in Kent, and there, in 1554, on the 29th of November, Philip Sidney was born. The King's last prayer had, at least, no immediate answer. Papistry had come back to England with redoubled vigour. The smoke of fires ascended to, and the cries and groans of martyrs were heard at the gates of heaven, and treason had done its worst with the Sidney family. One grandfather of the babe had died just in time, another had been beheaded, recanting and apologising. One uncle perished at the block, another escaped life and a prison at the same time. Sir Henry, whose mother had been governess to Edward the Sixth, and whose aunt had been to the same prince, such as among meaner personages is called a dry nurse, and from the time he left off sucking lay with him in bed so long as he remained in women's government, was loyal to the prince's sister, Queen Mary, though neither liking nor liked as he had been. On the 8th of November, 1554, all his former honours were confirmed to the good knight by charter of Queen Mary, and his first child, shortly afterwards born, was christened Philip, in honour of Mary's husband, Philip of Spain. Sir Henry was afterwards appointed vice-treasurer of the royal revenues in Ireland, and served there victoriously. In 1558 Queen Elizabeth confirmed him in his offices. On the 14th of May, 1563, he was made Knight of the Garter. In 1565, Lord Deputy in Ireland, when indeed the Queen had but a small part of that island to depute to any one. The O'Neill holding all the northern and western parts, and therein leaving the Queen nothing but the miserable town of Carrickfergus. But Sir Henry was a good soldier. He harassed the O'Neill, defeated him whenever he showed a head, and the Irish faction, being brought very low, treacherously rose on and slew their chieftain, and brought to the English captain his head pickled in a pipkin. Sir Henry was a wise and good governor, and did all he could to help the poor people, torn, distressed, and impoverished by factions and war. He never, he says with pity, saw more waste and desolate land. Noble walled towns, once with three hundred substantial householders, now with but four, and they ready to leave the place. All their cry is, Succour! 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 Succour and peace he gave them, and returned to England in 1564, to recruit his health. When Lord President of the Marches, Sir Henry had lived in Ludlow Castle, on the southern border of Shropshire, and his celebrated son was sent to school at Shrewsbury, under Thomas Ashton, a man known for learning, and at Oxford, perhaps a college friend of Sir Henry. Philip made good progress, and was renowned, says Ashton, for such staidness of mind, lovely and familiar gravity, 
a talk ever of knowledge, his very play tending to enrich his mind, which eminence in nature and industry made his worthy father's style Sir Philip in my hearing, though I unseen, lumen familiae suae. So early does Philip begin to shine. When the learned Ashton wrote his letter he was about eleven, for some time in 1568, when but thirteen, he went to Oxford, and was for some time a member of Christ Church, where he seems to have been considered as of rare merit, and indeed he was born to be loved. No young man ever won at so early an age so great a fame, for Sidney was not loved and admired for his Arcadia, so much as the book was loved and admired for its author. How was this? Surely no man, however well born in place, could achieve so sweet and lasting a fame in these days, and truly the praises of time past, a numerous and not altogether an unreasoning people, are borne out by great authorities when they say that the days of Queen Elizabeth, in the genius to which they gave birth, surpassed our own days of Queen Victoria. They, the English, had then, says Thomas Carlyle, their Shakespeare and Sir Philip Sidney, where we have our Sheridan Knowles and Beau Brummel. This is putting the matter in a nutshell. Not even the most enthusiastic admirer of the clever Irish dramatist would dare to compare him with Shakespeare, and no one who cares to take up the cudgels for that curious man and original fop Brummel, a man of singular history and a peculiar if not original genius for dandyism, could for a moment mention him by the side of the young, noble, and exalted knight, whose name has become a synonym for all that appertains to the soldier, the courtier, and the gentleman. The sovereigns that these two men served were not more different than their courtiers. From Elizabeth to George the Fourth, how great the stride! Whatever may be the opinion formed of Elizabeth, the greatest king that ever ruled in England, whether we regard her as a hypocrite, a tyrant, or a self-immolated martyr to her people and her country, and a virgin queen, there can be as little doubt of her ability as there is of the high power to which she raised the country which had the happiness to be governed by her. In no possible way is she to be compared to George the Fourth, any more than the great Tudor family can be compared to the House of Hanover. Even in her love of gorgeous apparel there was a queenly instinct of a noble kind, whereas George the Fourth had the spirit of a tailor, and the first gentleman in Europe, as he was called, only distinguished himself, as Thackeray said in his bitter quasi-epitaph, by a skill in cutting coats. So Bramall the Beau, although in his way a courtier, is utterly distinct from Sir Walter Raleigh, the noble fop, if such a word is not an insult applied to him, and from Sir Philip Sidney, the poetic frequenter of the court, perfect at all points. It would be useless to strain the comparison any further. Great and pure in his life, beautiful and elevated in his thoughts, at all times entering on or treading the high region of poetic fancy, Sir Philip Sidney has left a name which will always be quoted when one desires an instance of that noble ideal, the English gentleman. Dr. Zouch states that Philip went also to Cambridge. If he did, it was not for long, for at the age of seventeen he went on his travels, memorable enough for him, for he was one of those indignant Englishmen who, taking refuge with the English ambassador, Sir Francis Walsingham, said their prayers, with loaded firearms and drawn swords, and in bated breath, while Sir Francis looked from his window at the brutal massacre of St. Bartholomew. Escaping Paris, Sidney went to Hungary, Italy, and Germany, where he made a firm friend of Hubert Longuet, a man of great learning, and a friend of Melanchthon, and in 1575 returned to England. Next year, at the age of twenty-one, he was appointed ambassador to the Emperor of Austria, where he contracted a friendship with the famous Don John. Speaking too openly against the project of the Queen's marriage with the Duke of Anjou, he abandoned the court, and in retirement, at the seat of his brother-in-law, the Earl of Pembroke, wrote his Arcadia. The romance, dedicated to his sister, a married woman, it is well to remember, in excuse of certain passages, was never intended for publication. In 1583 he received the honour of knighthood. Three years afterwards he was made governor of Flushing, and general of the troops sent to the assistance of the United Provinces, then at war with the Roman Catholic powers. And at this time his reputation for learning, gentleness, wisdom, valour, and true knighthood stood so high that he was thought a fit candidate for the crown of Poland. Queen Elizabeth, whose loyal subject he was, would not allow him to be put in nomination, because, she said, and such a sentence to such a man was more than a crown, she could not brook the loss of the jewel of her dominions. That jewel was soon, however, to be lost in another way. Mounting his third horse, too, had been slain under him, at the bloody battle of Zutphen, he received a mortal wound in his thigh, probably injuring the femoral artery. This and death were owing to his chivalric gallantry. He was well armed when he went to the field, but meeting Sir William Pelham, Lord Marshal of the English camp, without armour lower than his breastplate, Sidney threw off his creases, and was foremost in the attack. The English, assailed on all sides, repelled their enemies, but a shot from an ambush struck Sidney in the left leg above the knee, splintering the bone. Faint with excess of bleeding, and carried along towards the place where was his uncle in general, the Earl of Leicester, he called for drink, which, says Lord Brook, was presently brought unto him. As he was putting the bottle to his mouth, he saw a poor soldier carried along, who had eaten his last at that same feast of death or glory, ghastly casting his eyes at the bottle, which Sir Philip perceiving, 
took from his head before he drank, and delivered it to the poor man with these words, Thy necessity is yet greater than mine. These touching words and this knightly act will be remembered as the last words of Sidney, who, however, lived afterwards for twenty-five days, and when dead, he was, by the order of his queen, brought home to the shores of the country which he had loved, served, and adorned, and buried with great state in the heart of a mighty city, in the old cathedral of St. Paul's. Impetuous, brave, transparent as a fair casement, graceful, accomplished as a scholar and as a knight, whether in the tournament or on the battlefield, a lover of his word, generous and open-handed, a sacrificer of himself, pure in his morals, unsullied in his honour, he had gained the love and esteem of all those who had the happiness to meet him. His memory is a very pleasant one to reflect on. It does honour to our nation, is bright, gentle, satisfying, and indeed flattering to our pride. Sidney never said a foolish or mean thing, and he did a thousand generous ones, of which his last act was but the crowning grace. We accept him as the type of what an English gentleman should be. He hated anything that was sordid and mean, his very faults we identify with the true, open, sunshine character of the man. In his Astrophel and Stella is the sentence, which should be above every author's desk, Look in thy heart and write, advice which Sidney ever followed. Sometimes, therefore, we get anger and hasty words out of that heart but never meanness, falsehood, or cowardice. Thus, believing that his father's secretary had betrayed him, and had been peeping and prying into his letters, he wrote, Mr. Molyneux, few words are best. My letters to my father have come to the eyes of some. Neither can I blame any one but you for it. If it be so, you have played the very knave with me. If I do know you henceforward read any letter that I write to my father, without his commandment or my consent, I will thrust my dagger into you, and trust to it, for I speak it in earnest. In the meantime, farewell." This is not the very gentle Sidney, but every one is aware that the best of us are not always angelic, forbearing, and wise. Poor Mr. Molyneux, it appears, moreover, was wholly innocent. Sidney's truest and best romance lay in his life, but yet there is, and will ever be, something very charming in his romance, the Arcadia. Everybody read the Arcadia when it was published, about four years after Sidney's death, although when dying he had desired it to be destroyed. But after passing through eleven editions it fell into a comparative oblivion. And this, too, as well as its success, is due to the book itself, for it is a very long romance, with a great deal of action in it, and full of romantic incidents, nor is the actual thread of the narrative broken. Yet it certainly contains elements of success, since, in addition to the merits above mentioned, it possesses some of the most natural and charming writing, some of the purest and most elevated conceptions ever put forward. Cooper the poet, a man of rare sensibility, has truly described the author as Sidney, warbler of poetic prose, so much does he warble that there are few pages in the folio that do not contain perfect gems in writing far better than any that are to be found in his poetry thus in one immortal passage a shepherd boy is described piping as though he never should grow old and parthenia's beauty is thus described her lips so they kept close with modest silence yet with a pretty kind of natural swelling seemed to invite the guests that looked on them her cheeks blushing when she was spoken unto a little smiling were like roses when their leaves are with a little breath stirred there is, moreover, in addition to such passages, an innate manliness in the book. Oh, says an old gentleman to the younger ones, you will never live to my age unless you keep yourself in breath with exercise, and in heart with joyfulness. Too much thinking doth consume the spirits, and oft it falls out that, when one thinks too much of his doing, he leaves to do the effect of his thinking. In describing two young princes, he does not waste words, like our late novelists, on the situation, riches, fine dresses, power, and beauty of such, but goes at once to the heart of the matter. Their knowledge was worthy of all princes, both to move them to do nobly, and to teach them how to do nobly, the beauty of virtue being still ever set before their eyes, and that taught them with far more diligent care than grammatical rules. They were also exercised in all methods, both of doing and suffering, and lastly we are told in a sentence which speaks to the heart of a good man, as a trumpet does to that of a soldier, nature had done so much for them in nothing as that it had made them lords of truth, whereon all other goods were builded. Such are the merits and beauties of the Arcadia that its great drawbacks, want of comprehensible plot, an utter entanglement of the thread of the story, and from numerous disguises the inability of the reader to distinguish the heroes and heroines, are forgotten by one who loves and admires poetic writing. But on the other hand, these drawbacks are so great that it is very difficult to relate succinctly what the story is. Shakespeare, our great character painter, was only twenty-two when Sidney died, and had not taught our writers to invent character and to give a living interest to all that they invented. Then again, Arcadia is in Greece, a fabulous and semi-pagan Greece, utterly unlike that of Pericles and Plato, or medieval Greece, or any other place with which modern knowledge is acquainted, and young people with every good quality and every beauty, wander about in woods, are taken by pirates, kill lions and bears, fall in love with each other, believe in Christianity and heathen gods, wear armour like Tudor knights, yea, dress up as Amazons and fight with the Helots and Lacedaemonians in a terribly confusing way. 
even sydney swarmer's admirer william Sturgeon, m a confesses that for a reader properly to understand the novel a biography of each person and a description of his disguises should be prefixed to the book while hazlitt plainly calls sydney's book tedious dry and silly nothing says dr drake can be more incompact and nerveless than the style of sydney but this is eminently untrue the style is beautiful it is the want of human interest that makes the story noblest when we complain of sydney we forget how much our great novelists have taught us and how it is that imperceptibly to them even the smallest writers have learnt how to make their pages lively by wit and interesting from the living humanity of their characters that the romance has been tedious to some there is little doubt horace walpole who could admire his own castle of otranto could by no means understand much less appreciate sydney's book he has not even included him among his royal and noble authors but in a notice of sydney's friend fulke greville lord brooke thus speaks of him no man seems to me so astonishing an object of temporary admiration as the celebrated friend of the lord brooke the famous sir philip sidney the learned of europe dedicated their works to him the republic of poland thought him at least worthy to be put in nomination for their crown all the houses of england wept his death when we at this distance of time inquire what prodigious merits excited such admiration what do we find great valour but it was an age of heroes in full of all other talents we have a tedious lamentable pedantic pastoral romance which the patience of a young virgin in love cannot now wade through and some absurd attempts to fetter english verse in roman chains a proof that this applauded author understood little of the genius of his own country the age of george the second was in good truth unable to comprehend that of elizabeth walpole returns to the charge in a note he had been blamed he said for not mentioning sir philip's defence of poetry which some think his best work i had indeed forgot it when i wrote this article nor can i conceive how a man who had in some respects written dully and weakly and who was at most far inferior to our best writers had obtained such immense reputation let his merits and his fame be weighed together and then let it be determined whether the world has overvalued or i undervalued sir philip sidney and again after slight praise of sidney's answer to the famous libel leicester's commonwealth he defends his uncle with great spirit what had been said in derogation to their blood seems to have touched sir philip most walpole has another fling at the hero whom he cannot understand he died with the rashness of a volunteer after having lived to write with the sang-froid and prolixity of mademoiselle scuderi walpole would have understood him if he could but there are those whose spirits move in charmed circles and they who are outside such circles cannot comprehend them it was about the time that walpole was penning this disastrous criticism and he was far from being a bad dilettante critic that young chatterton appealed to him uselessly as we know and then without a helping hand and with a rash impatience we all must deplore perished in his pride a very wreck of genius leaving us to marvel what he might have done he could have understood sydney and would have been charmed with the singular grace felicity of expression and sweet purity of the arcadia we are in the high mountain region of imperial fancy and our guide is scarcely to be blamed if we are unable to appreciate the prospect sydney's sentiments always naturally and delicately expressed are very pure and noble and if to read fielding after modern novels is as has been well said like walking over a breezy heath after being confined to the unwholesome air of a stifling chamber then the atmosphere of arcadia must be very rarefied and pure indeed such breezes as would blow only round the higher belts of parnassus all confess says fulke greville that arcadia of his to be in form and matter as inferior to that unbounded spirit as other men's wishes are raised above the writer's capacities but the truth is his end was not writing while he wrote but both his wit and understanding lent upon his heart to make himself and others not in words and opinion but in life and action good and great this is a noble vindication of him as a writer moreover we must remember that sidney begged that his book might be destroyed that he did not even read the sheets as they left his hand that no portion was printed during his life and that the first two books and a portion of the third are the only parts in any manner completed by himself ben johnson told drummond of hawthornden that he knew sir philip sidney meant to transform the arcadia into an english romance of which the hero should be king arthur this notion of writing perfectly english romance which is said to be the life dream of our present laureate is much happier than that of casting his story in some cloud cuckoo land inhabited by knights and ladies whose manners are taken from chivalry whose talk is platonic and whose religion is pagan but we must fain read the arcadia as it is and its beauties are such that when they are little accustomed to the treatment surely almost all readers will be delighted to be introduced to sydney in the portable and readable form which after much trouble and doubt is here attempted sydney also wrote a very noble defence of poesy and was so charmed with the description of the cave of despair by spencer who had dedicated to him the shepherd's calendar that he ordered a hundred pounds to be given to spencer for every stanza that he read till he threw down the book saying that if he read more he should give away all his fortune he invited spencer to penshurst where the two poets read plato and aristotle together and taught poetry under the wide-spreading beeches and the tall chestnuts of the palm but it is not in sydney's books that we must look for the hero his life was his best book 
it was his honour his dignity his accomplishments his true heroism the noble spirit of the gentleman that made everybody love him he was the ideal englishman of a noble day he did nothing for money but all for honour restless and ever active he was ready to share the glories of drake frobisher hawkins and those who saved us from the racks and thumbscrews ready prepared for the english protestants on board the invincible armada although he was godson of philip of spain or he would have sailed with the noble and adventurous sir walter raleigh he planned to go abroad with drake and fight the spaniards on the american main he was says lord brooke a man fit for conquest plantation reformation or whatever action is greatest and bravest among men and withal such a lover of mankind that whatsoever had any real parts in him found comfort participation and protection to the uttermost of his power like zephyrus he giving life wherever he blew this was the real secret why as a courtier even his enemies loved him why as a scholar all poets admired him why the universities abroad dedicated books to him and to quote again the noble words of lord brooke soldiers honoured him and were so honoured by him that no man thought that he marched under the true banner of mars that had not obtained sir philip sidney's approbation simply sidney was before and above everything a christian gentleman he came as we have shown of noble stock his father sir henry in his wars with ireland where he did all to civilize the savages he fought against had always a cheering word and brave face to show of a morning after his six hours sleep and where things were at the darkest and most dangerous pass would turn round in his saddle and address his soldiers as good friends and loving companions this brave man taught his sons to love god and truth first and then to be cheerful let your first action he wrote to his son be the lifting up of your mind to almighty god by hearty prayer then give yourself to be merry for you degenerate from your father if you find not yourself most able in wit and body to do anything when you be most merry his son from his very infancy was the delight and reward of his brave father and mother and that father happily went to an honoured grave mourned by his great queen who sent the king at arms to represent her in person and was buried in great state by her order that mother in a few months followed her noble husband leaving alive the son lumen familiae suae the very light of his family as his father had styled him but it was not for long that this light of the family was to remain unquenched sidney had tried said Fulk greville not to write off but to act out a noble life his death was to be the test and crown of this endeavour after his wound he was put on board his uncle's barge and carried to arnheim where for five-and-twenty days he lay dying and surrounded by his friends made before them such a confession of faith as no book but the heart can feelingly disclose he continually talked with his friend and chaplain in those days george gifford of the unsearchable goodness of god he moralized on his wound and wrote a poem called la cris rompue of which no portion remains his wife far advanced in her pregnancy hurried to watch by his bedside and nursed him with all wifely tenderness and with her and george gifford he often confessed his sins to god owning his unworthiness and praising god's mercy he talked much of the immortality of the soul and delighted not so much in the speculations of plato aristotle and cicero says one of his biographers as in the assurances of the bible and in cheering up his dying spirits to take possession of that immortal inheritance which was given to him by his brotherhood in christ once after gifford praying with him and raising his spirits and sidney worn to a shadow with his body mortifying his blade bones piercing through his skin did now and then despond he rallied his faith to the support of his soul and said as he contemplated the infinite wisdom and love of god i would not change my joy for the empire of the world he made a very full and precise will doing justice to all his creditors remembering all his friends and his servants and even as he was dying he cheered whilst chided the grief of his friends the most afflicted amongst whom was robert sidney his brother his last words to his brother and wife were love my memory cherish my friends their faith to me will assure you they are honest but above all govern your will and your affections by the will and word of your creator in the midst of his final agony when he bewailed his life noble as it was as vain vain his chaplain whispered in his ear to hold up his hand if he still felt gladness and consolation in god sidney lifted the wasted hand waved it on high and it then fell with weakness he joined his palms on his breast and with a joyful last look went forward to the unknown world and such was this young man aged only thirty-two that even his spanish enemies bewailed him the peasant at penshurst the courtier with his queen the great queen herself the meanest soldier in the camp lamented him and above two hundred authors wrote sad elegiacs on his death brought home to london the streets were thronged the lord mayor and aldermen robed in purple and on stately horses the deputies from foreign states came forth to follow his ashes english men and women wept and sobbed aloud and lamented for him as a brother and as the most beloved and first true gentleman of europe there is a lesson in such a life the principle on which this edition of the arcadia has been put through the press perhaps needs some explanation as the sheets of manuscript left the hands of sydney after the first book or perhaps two had been completed they were transmitted to his sister the countess of pembroke and some of them mislaid and lost hence one very great hiatus supplied by sir william alexander others 
by Richard Beeling and Mr. Johnston. It is also known that the Countess of Pembroke added to the episodes adventures and strange turns, at least in all the later books. Hence there is to be met with an Arcadian undergrowth which needs much careful pruning, and this undertaken with needful compression will leave the reader all that he desires of Sidney's own. Growing like certain fanciful parasites upon forest trees on the books of the Arcadia are certain eclogues of laboriously written and fantastical poetry, some in lighter measures against which Walpole was right to protest, and anent which Pope said, and Sidney's verse halts ill on Roman feet. These have been boldly removed without any loss, it is believed, to the romance. Lastly, long episodes of no possible use to the book, which we think have been supplied by other hands than Sidney's, have, whilst using their very words and phrases, been cut down. Tedious excrescences have thus been removed, but it is to be helped with judgment, so that the reader gets all we think is Sidney's, and without curb put upon his utterance. Moreover, the spelling of the author, in most obsolete words, is adhered to, and wherever the meaning of any is obscure, a note is added. And these words, as will be seen by the glossarial index, are many, and have been carefully illustrated by examples taken from writers previous to, or contemporary with Sidney, so that the study of philology may be slightly helped by a perusal of this charming romance. Otherwise it has been thought fit to adhere to an uniform method of orthography, but this makes little difference in our work. Thus in Book Two, there is a passage which is taken haphazard, so as to show how little variation there is between the spelling of Sidney and our own. But I had swum a very little way when I felt by reason of a wound that I had that I should not be able to abide the travel, and therefore seeing the mast whose tackling had been burnt off, float clear from the ship, I swam unto it, and getting on it, I found mine own sword, which by chance when I threw it away, caught by a piece of canvas, had hung to the mast. I was glad, because I loved it well. Now there are only four words here in which we vary from Sydney, and the reader will at once perceive them, the variations being italicised. We have adopted the past participle swum as being true English. We have excised or added letters to be, float, peace, and because, for the sake of uniformity, since the irregular way in which Sydney's printer spelt the words adds nothing to our knowledge nor our satisfaction. Where there is truly good reason to retain the Sydneyan form, it is always retained, so that if, as it is sincerely hoped, the popularity of this noble work revives, modern readers may learn to love Sydney in his own noble and simple dress. For his style it is easy, flowing, and copious, legible indeed, as Stijan says, that is easy to be read and understood, after the involved and pedantic stuff vented by too many of his predecessors. Sidney, the same writer adds, be it always remembered, was the first writer of good English prose. He is so, and he needs no modernization, like that which the facile Mrs. Stanley attempted on him, who removed not only all the quaintnesses and conceits, but the sweet bloom of diction, and every innocent grace of art. Sidney's work is indeed Merim Sal, the sweet food of sweetly uttered knowledge, and it must have been read and, as we have shown in the notes, made good use of by Ben Jonson, Shakespeare, Beaumont and Fletcher, and their contemporary dramatists, in whose dramatis personae many of his names are to be traced. Shakespeare borrows Leontes, Antigonus, Cleomenes, Archidamus, and Mopsa, and the episode of the bear from Arcadia, and although the winter's tale is said to be taken from Robert Green's Pandosto, and as you like it from some other source, there are traces of the Arcadia in the Bohemia, and in the sweet and enchanted forest of Arden. Of its own origin there may be a little said, the time was a knightly one, the form of chivalry had died out, but its spirit was still with us, though readers tired of Bevis of Hampton, Tristram of Lyonesse, Dennis of France, and Palmerin of England, or Amadis of Gaul, looked for others, hence Sidney's modification of a knightly and pastoral romance, something resembling those of Mademoiselle Scuderi, and yet coloured more after the Arcadia of San Azzaro, the Diana of Orge de Montemayor, the Arcadia of Lope de Vega, and Theagenes and Chariclea. It is added that many of the characters are from life. Musidorus and Pyrocles are supposed to be full gravel in Sydney. Philoclea and Pamela are Stella and the daughter of Essex. Cecropia, cruel, deceitful, bloody, is Catherine de Medici, and the wise Euarchus, Sir Henry Sydney. The scenery of the Arcadia is said to have been taken from that of Hackness, six miles northwest of Scarborough. This may be or may not be, it matters little. In the copy of the tenth edition, from which a present is printed, a learned antiquary, Samuel Weston, did one hundred years ago prefix on the fly-leaf a quotation from Ovid, expressive of the open, fresh, and morning feeling that a perusal of the Arcadia produces, and with this and its translation very beautifully done by the same hand, we take leave, wishing the reader hearty welcome to these sweet Arcadian scenes. Eke vigil rutilo, pate fecit ab ortu, pulpereas aurora fores, et plena rosarum atria. Behold the wakeful morn, has in the east unbarred her purple gates, and with red roses strewed her vestibule. End of introduction. The Epistle Dedicatory of the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia by Philip Sidney. The Epistle Dedicatory. To my dear lady and sister, the Countess of Pembroke. Here now have you, most dear, and most worthy to be most dear, lady, this idle work of mine, which I fear, like the spider's web, will be thought fitter to be swept away than worn to any other purpose. For my part, in very truth, as the cruel fathers among the Greeks were wont to do to the babes they would not foster, I could well find it in my heart to cast out in some desert of forgetfulness this child, which I am loath to father. But you desired me to do it, and your desire to my heart is an absolute commandment. Now it is done only for you, only to you. If you keep it to yourself or to such friends who will weigh errors in the balance of good will, I hope, for the father's sake, it will be pardoned, perchance made much of, though in itself it have deformities. For indeed, for severer eyes it is not, being but a trifle, and that triflingly handled. Your dear self can best witness the manner, being done in loose sheets of paper, most of it in your presence, the rest by sheets sent unto you as fast as they were done. In sum, a young head, not so well stayed as I would it were, and shall be when God will, having many, many fancies begotten in it, if it had not been in some way delivered, would have grown a monster, and more sorry might I be that they came in than that they got out. But his chief safety shall be the not walking abroad, and his chief protection the bearing the livery of your name, which, if much good will do not deceive me, is worthy to be a sanctuary for a greater offender. This say I, because I know the virtue so, and this say I, because it may be ever so, or, to say better, because it will be ever so. Read it, then, at your idle times, and the follies your good judgment will find in it blame not, but laugh at. And so, looking for no better stuff than, as in a haberdasher's shop, glasses or feathers, you will continue to love the writer, who doth exceedingly love you, and most, most heartily praise, you may long live to be a principal ornament to the family of the Sidneys. Your loving brother, Philip Sidney. End of the Epistle Dedicatory The First Book of the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia by Philip Sidney. The First Book, Part 1. It was in the time that the earth begins to put on her new apparel, against the approach of her lover, and that the sun, running a most even course, becomes an indifferent arbiter between the night and the day. When the hopeless shepherd Strephon was come to the sands, which lie against the island of Scythera, where viewing the place with a heavy kind of delight, and sometimes casting his eyes to the outward, he called his friendly rival, the pastor Claeus, unto him, and setting first down in his darkened countenance a doleful copy of what he would speak. O oh, my Claeus, said he, hither we are now come to pay the rent, for which we are so called unto by over-busy remembrance, restless remembrance, which claims not only this duty of us, but for it will have us forget ourselves. I pray you, when we were mid our flock, and that of other shepherds, some were running after their sheep strayed beyond their bounds, some delighting their eyes with seeing them nibble upon the short and sweet grass, some medicining their sick ewes, some setting a bell for an ensign of a sheepish squadron, some with more leisure inventing new games of exercising their bodies and sporting their wits. Did remembrance grant us any holiday, either for pastime or devotion, nay, either for necessary food or natural rest, but that still it forced our thoughts to work upon this place, where we last— alas that the word last should so long last did gaze our eyes upon her ever flourishing beauty did it not still cry within us ah you base-minded wretches are your thoughts so deeply mired in the trade of ordinary worldlings as for respect of gain some paltry wool may yield you to let so much time pass without knowing perfectly her estate especially in so troublesome a season to leave that shore unsaluted from whence you may see to the island where she dwelleth to leave those steps unkissed wherein urania printed the farewell of all beauty well then remembrance commanded we obeyed and here we find that as our remembrance came ever clothed unto us in the form of this place so this place gives new heat to the fever of our languishing remembrance yonder my claeus urania lighted the very horse methought bewailed to be so disburdened and as for thee poor claeus yonder my claeus when thou wentest to help her down i saw reverence and desire so divide thee that thou didst at one instant both blush and quake and instead of bearing her wert ready to fall down thyself. There she sate, vouchsafing my cloak, then most gorgeous under her. At yonder rising of the ground she turned herself, looking back toward her wonted abode, 
and because of her parting bearing much sorrow in her eyes the lightsomeness whereof had yet so natural a cheerfulness as it made even sorrow seem to smile at that turning she spake to us all opening the cherry of her lips and lord how greedily mine ears did feed upon the sweet words she uttered and here she laid her hand over thine eyes when she saw the tears springing in them as if she would conceal them from other and yet herself feel some of thy sorrow but woe is me yonder yonder did she put her foot into the boat at that instant as it were dividing her heavenly beauty between the earth and the sea but when she was embarked did you not mark how the winds whistled and the seas danced for joy how the sails did swell with pride and all because they had urania o urania blessed be thou urania the sweetest fairness and fairest sweetness with that word his voice brake so with sobbing that he could say no further and claus thus answered alas my strephon said he what needs is score to reckon up only our losses what doubt is there but that the sight of this place doth call our thoughts to appear at the court of affection held by that racking steward remembrance as well may sheep forget to fear when they spy wolves as we can miss such fancies when we see any place made happy by her treading who can choose that saw her but think where she stayed where she walked where she turned where she spoke but what is all this truly no more but as this place served us to think of those things so those things serve as places to call to memory more excellent matters no no let us think with consideration and consider with acknowledging and acknowledge with admiration and admire with love and love with joy in the midst of all woes let us in such sort think i say that our poor eyes were so enriched as to behold and our low heart so exalted as to love a maid who is such that as the greatest thing the world can show is her beauty so the least thing that may be praised in her is her beauty certainly as her eyelids are more pleasant to behold than two white kids climbing up a fair tree and browsing on his tenderest branches and yet are nothing compared to the day shining stars contained in them and as her breath is more sweet than a gentle south-west wind which comes creeping over flowery fields and shadowed waters in the extreme heat of summer and yet is nothing compared to the honey-flowing speech that breath doth carry no more all that our eyes can see of her though when they have seen her what else they shall ever see is but dry stubble after clover-grass is to be matched with the flock of unspeakable virtues laid up delightfully in that blessed builded fold but indeed as we can better consider the sun's beauty by marking how he gilds these waters and mountains than by looking upon his own face too glorious for our weak eyes so it may be our conceits not able to bear her sun-staining excellency will better weigh it by her works upon some meaner subject employed and alas who can better witness that than we whose experience is grounded upon feeling hath not the only love of her made us being silly ignorant shepherds raise up our thoughts above the ordinary level of the world so as great clerks do not disdain our conference hath not the desire to seem worthy in her eyes made us when others were sleeping to sit viewing the course of the heavens when others were running at base to run over learned writings when others mark their sheep we to mark ourselves hath not she thrown reason upon our desires and as it were given eyes unto cupid hath in any but in her love fellowship maintained friendship between rivals and beauty taught the beholders chastity he was going on with his praises but strephon bade him stay and look and so they both perceived a thing which floated drawing nearer and nearer to the bank but rather by the favourable working of the sea than by any self-industry they doubted a while what it should be till it was cast up even hard before them at which time they fully saw that it was a man whereupon running for pity's sake unto him they found his hands as it should appear constanter friends to his life than his memory fast gripping upon the edge of a square small coffer which lay all under his breast else in himself no show of life so as the board seemed to be but a bier to carry him a land to his sepulchre so drew they up a young man of so goodly shape and well-pleasing favour that one would think death had in him a lovely countenance and that though he were naked nakedness was to him an apparel that sight increased their compassion and their compassion called up their care so that lifting his feet above his head making a great deal of salt water come out of his mouth they laid him upon some of their garments and fell to rub and chafe him till they brought him to recover both breath the servant and warmth the companion of living at length opening his eyes he gave a great groan a doleful note but a pleasant ditty for by that they found not only life but strength of life in him they therefore continued on their charitable office until his spirits being well returned he without so much as thanking them for their pains got up and looking round about to the uttermost limits of his sight and crying upon the name of pyrocles nor seeing nor hearing cause of comfort what said he and shall musidorus live after pyrocles destruction therewithal he offered wilfully to cast himself again into the sea but they ran unto him and pulling him back then too feeble for them by force stickled that unnatural fray i pray you said he honest men what such right have you in me as not to suffer me to do with myself what i list and what policy have you to bestow a benefit where it is counted an injury 
they hearing him speak in greek which was their natural language became the more tender-hearted towards him and considering by his calling and looking that the loss of some dear friend was great cause of his sorrow told him they were poor men that were bound by cause of humanity to prevent so great a mischief and that they wished him if opinion of somebody's perishing bred such desperate anguish in him that he should be comforted by his own proof who had lately escaped as apparent danger as any might be no no said he it is not for me to attend so high a blissfulness but since you take care of me i pray you find means that some bark may be provided that will go out of the haven that if it be possible we may find the body far far too precious food for fishes and for the hire said he i have within this casket of value sufficient to content them close presently went to a fisherman and having agreed with him and provided some apparel for the naked stranger he embarked and the shepherds with him and were no sooner gone beyond the mouth of the haven but that some way into the sea they might discern as it were a stain of the water's colour and by time some sparks and smoke mounting thereout but the young man no sooner saw it but that beating his breast he cried that there was the beginning of his ruin entreating them to bend their course as near unto it as they could telling how that smoke was but a small relic of a great fire which had driven both him and his friend rather to commit themselves to the cold mercy of the sea than to abide the hot cruelty of the fire and that therefore though they both had abandoned the ship that he was if anywhere in that course to be met with all they steered therefore as near thitherward as they could but when they came so near as their eyes were full masters of the object they saw a sight full of piteous strangeness a ship or rather the carcass of the ship or rather some few bones of the carcass hulling there part broken part burned part drowned death having used more than one dart to that destruction about it floated great store of very rich things and many chests which might promise no less and amidst the precious things were a number of dead bodies which likewise did not only testify both elements violence but that the chief violence was grown of human inhumanity for their bodies were full of grisly wounds and their blood had as it were filled the wrinkles of the sea's visage which it seemed the sea would not wash away that it might witness it is not always his fault when we do condemn his cruelty in some a defeat where the conquered kept both field and spoil a shipwreck without storm or ill footing and a waste of fire in the midst of the water but a little way off they saw the mast whose proud height now lay along like a widow having lost her mate of whom she held her honour but upon the mast they saw a young man at least if he were a man bearing show of about eighteen years of age who sat as on horseback having nothing upon him but his shirt which being wrought with blue silk and gold had a kind of resemblance to the sea on which the sun then near his western home did shoot some of his beams his hair which the young men of greece used to wear very long was stirred up and down with the wind which seemed to have a sport to play with it as the sea had to kiss his feet himself full of admirable beauty set forth by the strangeness both of his seat and gesture for holding his head up full of unmoved majesty he held a sword aloft with his fair arm which often he waved about his crown as though he would threaten the world in that extremity but the fishermen when they came so near him that it was time to throw out a rope by which hole they might draw him their simplicity bred such amazement and their amazement such superstition that as they went under sail by him they held up their hands and made their prayers which when musidorus saw though he were almost as much ravished with joy as they with astonishment he leapt to the mariner and took the cord out of his hand and saying dost thou live and art well who answered thou canst tell best since most of my well-being stands in thee threw it out but already the ship was passed beyond pyrocles and therefore musidorus could do no more but persuade the mariners to cast about again assuring them that he was but a man although of most divine excellences and promising great rewards for their pains and now they were already come upon the stays when one of the sailors descried a galley which came with sails and oars directly in the chase of them and straight perceived it was a well-known pirate who hunted not only for goods but for bodies of men which he employed either to be his galley-slaves or to sell at the best market which when the master understood he commanded forthwith to set on all the canvas they could and fly homeward leaving in that sort poor pyrocles so near to be rescued but what did not musidorus say what did he not offer to persuade them to venture the fight but fear standing at the gates of their ears put back all persuasions so that he had nothing wherewith to accompany pyrocles but his eyes nor to succour him but his wishes therefore praying for him and casting a long look that way he saw the galley leave the pursuit of them and turn to take up the spoils of the other wreck and lastly he might well see them lift up the young man and alas said he to himself dear pyrocles shall that body of thine be enchained shall those victorious hands of thine be commanded to base offices shall virtue become a slave to those that be slaves to viciousness alas better had it been thou hadst ended nobly thy noble days what death is so evil as unworthy servitude but that opinion soon ceased when he saw the galley setting upon another ship which held long and strong fight with her for then he began afresh to fear the life of his friend and to wish well to the pirates whom before he hated lest in their ruin he might perish but the fisherman made such speed into the haven that they absented his eyes from beholding the issue 
where being entered he could procure neither them nor any other as then to put themselves into the sea so that being as full of sorrow for being unable to do anything as void of counsel how to do anything besides that sickness grew something upon him the honest shepherds strephon and claus who being themselves true friends did the more perfectly judge the justness of his sorrow advised him that he should mitigate somewhat of his woe since he had gotten an amendment in fortune being come from assured persuasion of his death to have no cause to despair of his life as one that had lamented the death of his sheep should after know they were but strayed and would receive pleasure though readily he knew not where to find them now sir said they thus for ourselves it is we are in profession but shepherds and in this country of laconia little better than strangers and therefore neither in skill nor ability of power greatly to stead you but what we can present unto you is this arcadia of which country we are is but a little way hence and even upon the next confines there dwelleth a gentleman by name calendar who vouchsafeth much favour unto us a man who for his hospitality is so much haunted that no news stir but come to his ears for his upright dealing so beloved of his neighbours that he hath many ever ready to do him their uttermost service and by the great good will our prince bears him may soon obtain the use of his name and credit which hath a principal away not only in his own arcadia but in all these countries of peloponnesus and which is worth all all these things give him not so much power as his nature gives him will to benefit so that it seems no music is so sweet to his ear as deserve thanks to him we will bring you and there you may recover again your health without which you cannot be able to make any diligent search for your friend and therefore you must labour for it besides we are sure the comfort of courtesy and ease of wise counsel shall not be wanting musidorus who besides he was merely unacquainted in the country had his wits astonished with sorrow gave easy consent to that from which he saw no reason to disagree and therefore defraying the mariners with the ring bestowed upon them they took their journey together through laconia claus and strephon by course carrying his chest for him musidorus only bearing in his countenance evident marks of a sorrowful mind supported with a weak body which they perceiving and knowing that the violence of sorrow is not at the first to be striven with all being like a mighty beast sooner tamed with following than overthrown by withstanding they gave way unto it for that day and the next never troubling him either with asking questions or finding fault with his melancholy but rather fitting to his dolour dolorous discourses of their own and other folks misfortune which speeches though they had not a lively entrance to his senses shut up in sorrow yet like one half asleep he took hold of much of the matter spoken unto him so as a man may say ere sorrow was aware they made his thoughts bear away something else beside his own sorrow which wrought so in him that at length he grew content to mark their speeches then to marvel at such wit in shepherds after to like their company and lastly to vouchsafe conference so that the third day after in the time that the morning did strew roses and violets in the heavenly floor against the coming of the sun the nightingales striving one with the other which could in most dainty variety recount their wrong caused sorrow made them put off their sleep and rising from under a tree which that night had been their pavilion they went on their journey which by and by welcomed musidora's eyes with delightful prospects there were hills which garnished their proud heights with stately trees humble valleys whose base estates seemed comforted with the refreshing of silver rivers meadows enamelled with all sorts of eye-pleasing flowers thickets which being lined with most pleasant shade were witnessed so too by the cheerful disposition of many well-tuned birds each pasture stored with sheep feeding with sober security while the pretty lambs with bleating oratory craved the dam's comfort here a shepherd's boy piping as though he should never be old there a young shepherdess knitting and withal singing and it seemed that her voice comforted her hands to work and her hands kept time to her voice music as for the houses of the country for many houses came under their eye they were all scattered no two being one by the other and yet not so far off as that it barred mutual succour a show as it were of an accompanable solitariness and of a civil wildness i pray you said musidorus then first unsealing his long silent lips what countries be these we pass through which are so diverse in show the one wanting no store the other having no store but of want the country answered claus where you were cast ashore and now are passed through is laconia not so poor by the barrenness of the soil though in itself not passing fertile as by a civil war which being these two years within the bowels of that estate between the gentlemen and the peasants by them named helots hath in this sort as it were disfigured the face of nature and made it so unhospitable as now you have found it the towns neither of the one side nor the other willingly opening their gates to strangers nor strangers willingly entering for fear of being mistaken but this country where now you set your foot is arcadia and even hard by is the house of calendar whither we lead you this country being thus decked with peace and the child of peace good husbandry these houses you see so scattered are of men as we too are that live upon the commodity of their sheep and therefore in the division of the arcadian estate are termed shepherds 
a happy people wanting little because they desire not much what cause then said musidorus made you leave this sweet life and put yourself in yonder unpleasant and dangerous realm guarded with poverty answered strephon and guided with love but now said claus since it hath pleased you to ask anything of us whose baseness is such as the very knowledge is darkness give us leave to know something of you and of the young man you so much lament that at least we may be the better instructed to inform calendar and he the better know how to proportion his entertainment musidorus according to the agreement between pyrocles and him to alter their names answered that he called himself palladius and his friend daiphantus but till i have him again said he i am indeed nothing and therefore my story is of nothing his entertainment since so good a man he is cannot be so low as i account my estate and in sum the sum of all his courtesy may be to help me by some means to seek my friend they perceived he was not willing to open himself further and therefore without further questioning brought him to the house about which they might see with fit consideration both of the air the prospect and the nature of the ground all such necessary additions to a great house as might well show calendar knew that provision is the foundation of hospitality and thrift the fuel of magnificence the house itself was built of fair and strong stone not affecting so much any extraordinary kind of fineness as an honourable representing of a firm stateliness the lights doors and stairs rather directed to the use of the guest than to the eye of the artificer and yet as the one chiefly heeded so the other not neglected each place handsome without curiosity and homely without loathsomeness not so dainty as not to be trod on nor yet slubbered up with good fellowship all more lasting than beautiful but that the consideration of the exceeding lastingness made the eye believe it was exceeding beautiful the servants not so many in number as cleanly in apparel and serviceable in behaviour testifying even in their countenances that their master took as well care to be served as of them that did serve one of them was forthwith ready to welcome the shepherds as men who though they were poor their master greatly favoured and understanding by them that the young man with them was to be much accounted of for that they had seen tokens of more than common greatness howsoever now eclipsed with fortune he ran to his master who came presently forth and pleasantly welcoming the shepherds but especially applying him to musidorus strephon privately told him all what he knew of him and particularly that he found this stranger was loath to be known no said calendar speaking aloud i am no herald to inquire of men's pedigrees it sufficeth me if i know their virtues which if this young man's face be not a false witness do better apparel his mind than you have done his body while he was thus speaking there came a boy in show like a merchant's prentice who taking strephon by the sleeve delivered him a letter written jointly both to him and claus from urania which they no sooner had read but that with short leave-taking of calendar who quickly guessed and smiled at the matter and once again though hastily recommending the young man unto him they went away leaving musidorus even loath to part with them for the good conversation he had of them an obligation he accounted himself tied in unto them and therefore they delivering his chest unto him he opened it and would have presented them with two very rich jewels but they absolutely refused them telling him that they were more than enough rewarded in the knowing of him and without hearkening unto reply like men whose hearts disdained all desires but one gat speedily away as if the letter had brought wings to make them fly but by that sight calendar soon judged that his guest was of no mean calling and therefore the more respectfully entertaining him musidorus found his sickness which the fight the sea and late travel had laid upon him grow greatly so that fearing some sudden accident he delivered the chest to calendar which was full of most precious stones gorgeously and cunningly set in divers manners desiring him he would keep those trifles and if he died he would bestow so much as was needful to find out and redeem a young man naming himself daiphantus as then in the hands of laconian pirates but calendar seeing him faint more and more with careful speed conveyed him to the most commodious lodging in his house where being possessed with an extreme burning fever he continued some while with no great hope of life but youth at length got the victory of sickness so that in six weeks the excellency of his returned beauty was a credible ambassador of his health to the great joy of calendar who as in this time he had by certain friends of his that dwelt near the sea in messenia set forth a ship and a galley to seek and succour daiphantus so at home did he omit nothing which he thought might either profit or gratify palladius for having found in him besides his bodily gifts beyond the degree of admiration by daily discourses which he delighted himself to have with him a mind of most excellent composition a piercing wit quite void of ostentation high erected thoughts seated in a heart of courtesy an eloquence as sweet in the uttering as slow to come to the uttering a behaviour so noble as gave a majesty to adversity and all in a man whose age could not be above one and twenty years the good old man was even enamoured with a fatherly love towards him or rather became his servant by the bond such virtue laid upon him once he acknowledged himself so to be by the badge of diligent attendance but palladius having gotten his health and only staying there to be in place where he might hear answer of the ship set forth 
calendar one afternoon led him abroad to a well-arrayed ground he had behind his house which he thought to show him before his going as the place himself more than in any other delighted the back side of the house was neither field garden nor orchard or rather it was both field garden and orchard for as soon as the descending of the stairs had delivered them down they came into a place cunningly set with trees of the most taste-pleasing fruits but scarcely they had taken that into their consideration but that they were suddenly stepped into a delicate green of each side of the green a thicket and behind the thickets again new beds of flowers which being under the trees the trees were to them a pavilion and they to the trees a mosaical floor so that it seemed art therein would needs be delightful by counterfeiting error and making order in confusion hence palladius was led towards a fair pond whose shaking crystal was a perfect mirror to all other beauties and near it was a fine fountain made thus a figure of a naked venus of white marble wherein the graver had used such cunning that the natural blue veins of the marble were framed in fit places to set forth the beautiful veins of her body at her breast was her babe aeneas who seemed having begun to suck to leave that to look upon her fair eyes which smiled at the babe's folly meanwhile the breast running hard by was a house of pleasure adorned with delightful pictures which calendar described and then sometimes casting his eyes to the pictures thus spake this country arcadia among all the provinces of greece hath ever been had in singular reputation partly for the sweetness of the air and other natural benefits but principally for the well-tempered minds of the people who finding that the shining title of glory so much affected by other nations doth indeed help little to the happiness of life are the only people which as by their justice and providence give neither cause nor hope to their neighbours to annoy them so are they not stirred with false praise to trouble others quiet thinking it a small reward for the wasting of their own lives in ravening that their posterity should long after say they had done so even the muses seem to approve their good determination by choosing this country for their chief repairing place and by bestowing their perfection so largely here that the very shepherds have their fancies lifted to so high conceits as the learned of other nations are content both to borrow their names and imitate their cunning here dwelleth and reigneth this prince whose picture you see by name basilius a prince of sufficient skill to govern so quiet a country where the good minds of the former princes had set down good laws and the well bringing up of the people doth serve as a most sure bond to hold them he being already well stricken in years married a young princess named gynecia daughter to the king of cyprus of notable beauty as by her picture you see a woman of great wit and in truth of more princely virtues than her husband of most unspotted chastity but of so working a mind and so vehement spirits as a man may say it was happy she took a good course for otherwise it would have been terrible of these two are brought to the world two daughters so beyond measure excellent in all the gifts allotted to reasonable creatures that we may think they were born to show that nature is no stepmother to that sex how much serve as some men sharp-witted only in evil speaking have sought to disgrace them the eldest named pamela by many men not deemed inferior to her sister for my part when i marked them both methought there was if at least such perfections may receive the word of more more sweetness in philoclea but more majesty in pamela methought love played in philoclea's eyes and threatened in pamela's methought philoclea's beauty only persuaded but so persuaded as all hearts must yield pamela's beauty used violence and such violence as no heart could resist and it seems that such proportion is between their minds philoclea so bashful as though her excellencies had stolen into her before she was aware so humble that she will put all pride out of countenance in some such proceeding as will stir hope but teach hope good manners pamela of high thoughts who avoids not pride with not knowing her excellencies but by making that one of her excellencies to be void of pride her mother's wisdom greatness nobility but if i can guess aright knit with a more constant temper now then our basilius being so publicly happy as to be a prince and so happy in that happiness as to be a beloved prince and so in his private blessed as to have so excellent a wife and so over excellent children hath of late taken a course which yet makes him more spoken of than all these blessings for having made a journey to delphos and safely returned within short space he brake up his court and retired himself his wife and children into a certain forest hereby which he calleth his desert wherein besides an house appointed for stables and lodgings for certain persons of mean calling who do all household services he hath builded two fine lodges in the one of them himself remains with his younger daughter philoclea which was the cause they three were matched together in this picture without having any other creature living in that lodge with him which though it be strange yet not so strange as the course he has taken with the princess pamela whom he hath placed in the other lodge but how think you accompanied truly with none other but one demetus the most arrant doltish clown that i think ever was without the privilege of a bauble with his wife miso and daughter mopsa in whom no wit can devise anything wherein they may pleasure her but to exercise her patience and to serve for a foil of her perfections this loutish clown is such that you never saw so ill-favoured a visor his behaviour is such that he is beyond the degree of ridiculous and for his apparel even as i would wish him 
me so his wife so handsome a beldame that only her face and her splay foot have made her accuse for a witch only one good point she hath that she observes decorum having a froward mind in a wretched body between these two personages who never agreed in any humour but in disagreeing is issued forth mistress mopsa a fit woman to participate of both their perfections this demetus the prince finds while hunting and like other princes whose doings have been often smoothed with good success thinking nothing so absurd that they cannot make honourable rings with him when the flattering courtiers had no sooner taken the prince's mind than demetus's silence grew wit bluntness integrity his beastly ignorance virtuous simplicity and the prince according to the nature of great persons in love with that he had done himself fancied that his weakness with his presence would much be mended and so like a creature of his own making he liked him more and more and thus having first given him the office of principal herdsman and lastly since he took this strange determination he hath in a manner put the life of himself and his children into his hands which authority like too great a sail for so small a boat doth so oversway poor demetus that if before he were a good fool in a chamber he might be allowed it now in a comedy so as i doubt me i fear me indeed my master will in the end with his cost find that his office is not to make men but to use men as men are no more than a horse will be taught to hunt or an ass to manage thus much now that i have told you is nothing more than in effect any arcadian knows but one moved him to this strange solitariness hath been imparted as i think but to one person living myself can conjecture and indeed more than conjecture by this accident that i will tell you i have an only son by name clytophon who is now absent preparing for his own marriage which i mean shortly shall be here celebrated this son of mine while the prince kept his court was of his bedchamber now since the breaking up thereof returned home and showed me among other things he had gathered the copy which he had taken of a letter which when the prince had read he had laid in a window presuming nobody durst look in his writings but my son not only took a time to read it but to copy it in truth i blame clytophon for the curiosity which made him break his duty in such a kind whereby king's secrets are subject to be revealed but since it was done i was content to take so much profit as to know it end of book one part one Book One, Part Two of the Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia by Philip Sidney. Book One, Part Two. This letter is from a nobleman of his country named Philanax, appointed by the Prince Regent in this time of his retiring, and most worthy so to be for there lives no man whose excellent wit more simply embraceth integrity beside his unfeigned love to his master wherein never yet any could make question saving whether he loved basilius or the prince better a rare temper while most men either servilely yield to all appetites or with an obstinate austerity looking to that they fancy good in effect neglect the prince's person this then being the man whom of all other and most worthy the prince chiefly loves it should seem for more than the letter i have not to guess by that the prince upon his return from delphos philanax then lying sick had written unto him his determination rising as evidently appears upon some oracle he had there received to this philanax sent a reply urging that wisdom and virtue be the only destinies appointed for man to follow and that the heavenly powers should be reverence not searched into and their mercies rather by prayers to be sought than their hidden counsels by curiosity that sooth saying since after all the gods have left us to ourselves sufficient guides are nothing but fancy wherein there must either be vanity or infallibleness and so either not to be respected or not to be prevented therefore he counselled basilius to continue his government which had been good to his people and which his neighbours had found not so hurtlessly strong that they thought it better to rest in his friendship than make a new trial of his enmity for his second resolution of confining his daughters so as to suffer no unworthy suitor to come to them and indeed to keep them both unmarried that were to kill the joy of posterity strictness is not the way to preserve virtue he had better leave women's minds the most untamed that way of any for no cage will please a bird and every dog is the fiercer for tying as for giving pamela to the care of the clown demeters it was folly for fools can hardly be virtuous he cannot be good that knows not why he's good these reasons he philanax humbly submitted to the gracious consideration of basilius beseeching him again to stand wholly on his own virtue by the matter of this letter you may perceive that the cause of all hath been the vanity which possesseth many who making a perpetual mansion of this poor baiting place of man's life are desirous to know the certainty of things to come wherein there is nothing so certain as our continual uncertainty but what in particular points the oracle was in faith i know not neither philanax himself distinctly knew but this experience shows us that basilius's judgment corrupted with the prince's fortune hath rather heard than followed the wise as i take it counsel of philanax for having left the stern of his government with much amazement to the people 
among whom many strange brutes are received for current and with some appearance of danger in respect of the valiant amphialus his nephew and much envying the ambitious number of the nobility against philanax to see philanax so advanced though to speak simply he deserved more than as many of us as there be in arcadia the prince himself hath hidden his head in such sort as i told you not sticking plainly to confess that he means not while he breathes that his daughter shall have any husband but keep them thus solitary with him where he gives no other body leave to visit him at any time but a certain priest who being excellent in poetry he makes him write out such things as he best likes he being no less delightful in conversation than needful for devotion and about twenty specified shepherds in whom some for exercises and some for eclogues he taketh greater recreation and now you know as much as myself calendar by this time discovered that it was fitter time to pay with their suppers the duty they owed to their stomachs than to break the air with idle discourses for more wit he had learned of homer never to entertain either hosts or guests with long speeches till the mouth of hunger be stopped so withal he arose leading palladius who assured him that he had been more fed by his discourses than he could be by the skilfullest trenchermen of media to the parlour where they used to sup being come to the supping-place one of calendar's servants rounded in his ear at which his colour changing he retired himself into his chamber commanding his men diligently to wait upon palladius and to excuse his absence with some necessary business he had presently to dispatch which they accordingly did for some few days forcing themselves to let no change appear but though they framed their countenances never so cunningly palladius perceived there was some ill-pleasing accident fallen out whereupon being again set alone at supper he called to the steward and desired him to tell him the matter of his sudden alteration who after some trifling excuses in the end confessed unto him that his master had received news that his son before the day of his near marriage chanced to be at a battle which was to be fought between the gentlemen of lacedaemon and the helots who winning the victory he was there made prisoner going to deliver a friend of his taken prisoner by the helots that the poor young gentleman had offered great ransom for his life but that the hate those peasants conceived against all gentlemen was such that every hour he was to look for nothing but some cruel death which hitherunto had only been delayed by the captain's vehement dealing for him who seemed to have a heart of more manly pity than the rest but palladius could scarce hear out his tale with patience so was his heart torn in pieces with compassion of the case liking of calendar's noble behaviour kindness for his respect to himward and desire to find some remedy besides the image of this dearest friend deophantus whom he judged to suffer either a like or worse fortune therefore rising from the board he desired the steward to tell him particularly the ground and event of this accident because by knowledge of many circumstances there might perhaps some way of help be opened whereunto the steward easily in this sort condescended my lord said he when our good king basilius with better success than expectation took to wife even in his more than decaying years the fair young princess gynecia there came with her a young lord cousin german to herself named argalus led hither partly with the love and honour of his noble kinswoman partly with the humour of youth which ever thinks that good whose goodness he sees not and in this court he received so good increase of knowledge that after some years spent he so manifested a most virtuous mind in all his actions that arcadia gloried such a plant was transported unto them being a gentleman indeed most rarely accomplished excellently learned but without all vain glory friendly without facetiousness valiant so as for my part i think the earth hath no man that hath done more heroical acts than he however now of late the same flies of the two princes of thessalia and macedon and hath long done of our noble prince amphialus who indeed in our parts is only accounted likely to match him but i say for my part i think no man for valour of mind and ability of body to be preferred if equal to argalus my master's son clitophon whose loss gives the cause to this discourse and yet gives me cause to begin with argalus since his loss proceeds from argalus being a young gentleman as of great birth being our king's sister's son so truly of good nature and one that can see good and love it haunted more the company of this worthy argalus than of any other so as if there were not a friendship which is so rare as it is to be doubted whether it be a thing indeed or but a word at least there was such a liking and friendliness as hath brought forth the effects which you shall hear about two years since it so fell out that he brought him to a great lady's house sister to my master who had with her her only daughter the fair parthenia fair indeed fame i think itself daring not to call any fairer if it be not helen queen of corinth and the two incomparable sisters of arcadia and that which made her fairness much the fairer was that it was but a fair ambassador of a most fair mind full of wit and a wit which delighted more to judge itself than to show itself her speech being as rare as precious her silence without sullenness her modesty without affectation 
a shamefastness without ignorance in some one that to praise well one must first set down with himself what it is to be excellent for so she is i think you think that these perfections meeting could not choose but find one another and delight in that they found for likeness of manners is likely in reason to draw liking with affection men's actions do not always cross with reason to be short it did so indeed they loved although for a while the fire thereof hope's wings being cut off were blown by the bellows of despair upon this occasion there had been a good while before and so continued a suitor to this same lady a great nobleman though of laconia yet near neighbour to parthenia's mother named demagoras a man mighty in riches and power and proud thereof stubbornly stout loving nobody but himself and for his own delight's sake parthenia and pursuing vehemently his desire his riches had so gilded over all his other imperfections that the old lady though contrary to my lord her brother's mind had given her consent and using a mother's authority upon her fair daughter had made her yield thereunto not because she liked her choice but because her obedient mind had not yet taken upon it to make choice and the day of the assurance drew near when my young lord clitophon brought this noble argalus perchance principally to see so rare a sight as parthenia by all well judging eyes was judged but though few days were before the time of assurance appointed yet love that saw he had a great journey to make in short time hasted so himself that before her word could tie her to demagoras her heart hath bowed her to argalus with so grateful a receipt in mutual affection that if she desired above all things to have argalus argalus feared nothing but to miss parthenia and now parthenia had learned both liking and misliking loving and loathing and out of passion began to take the authority of judgment insomuch that when the time came that demagoras full of proud joy thought to receive the gift of herself she with words of resolute refusal though with tears showing she was sorry she must refuse assured her mother she would first be bedded in her grave than wedded to demagoras the change was no more strange than unpleasant to the mother who being determinately lest i should say of a great lady wilfully bent to marry her to demagoras tried all ways which a witty and hard-hearted mother could use upon so humble a daughter in whom the only resisting power was love but the more she assaulted the more she taught parthenia to defend and the more parthenia defended the more she made her mother obstinate in the assault who at length finding that argalus standing between them was it that most eclipsed her affection from shining upon demagoras she sought all means how to remove him so much the more as he manifested himself an unremovable suitor to her daughter first by employing him in as many dangerous enterprises as ever the evil stepmother juno recommended to the famous hercules but the more his virtue was tried the more pure it grew while all the things she did to overthrow him did set him up upon the height of honour lastly by treasons demagoras and she would have made away argalus but he with providence and courage so passed over all that the mother took such a spiteful grief at it that her heart brake withal and she died but then demagoras assuring himself that now parthenia was her own she would never be his and receiving as much by her own determinate answer not more desiring his own happiness than envying argalus whom he saw with narrow eyes even ready to enjoy the perfection of his desires strengthening his conceit with all the mischievous counsels which disdain love and envious pride could give unto him the wicked wretch taking a time that argalus was gone to his country to fetch some of his principal friends to honour the marriage which parthenia had most joyfully consented unto the wicked demagoras i say desiring to speak with her with unmerciful force her weak arms in vain resisting rubbed all over her face a most horrible poison the effect whereof was such that never leper looked more ugly than she did which done having his men and horses ready departed away in spite of her servants as ready to revenge as could be in such an unexpected mischief but the abominableness of this fight being come to my lord calendar he made such means both by our king's intercession and his own that by the king and senate of lacedaemon demagoras was upon pain of death banished the country who hating the punishment where he should have hated the fault joined himself with all the power he could make unto the helots lately in rebellion against that state and they glad to have a man of such authority among them made him their general and under him have committed divers the most outrageous villainies that a base multitude full of desperate revenge can imagine but within a while after this pitiful fact committed upon a parthenia argalus returned poor gentleman having her fair image in his heart and already promising his eyes the uttermost of his felicity when they nobody else daring to tell it him were the first messengers to themselves of their own misfortune i mean not to move passions with telling you the grief of both when he knew her for at first he did not nor at first knowledge could possibly have virtue's aid so ready as not even weakly to lament the loss of such a jewel so much the more as that skilful men in that art assured it was unrecoverable but within a while truth of love which still held the first face in his memory 
a virtuous constancy, and even a delight to be constant, faith given, and inward worthiness shining through the foulest mists, took so full hold of the noble Argalus that, not only in such comfort which witty arguments may bestow upon adversity, but even with the most abundant kindness that an eye-ravished lover can express, he laboured both to drive the extremity of sorrow from her, and to hasten the celebration of their marriage, whereunto he unfeignedly showed himself no less cheerfully earnest, than if she had never been disinherited of that goodly portion which nature had so liberally bequeathed unto her, and for that cause deferred his intended revenge upon Demagoras, because he might continually be in her presence, showing more humble serviceableness and joy to content her than ever before. But as he gave this rare example, not to be hoped for of any other but of another Argalus, so of the other side she took a stranger course in affection, for where she desired to enjoy him more than to live, yet did she overthrow both her own desire and his, and in no sort would yield to marry him, with a strange encounter of love's affects and effects, that he, by an affection sprung from excessive beauty, should delight in horrible foulness, and she, of a vehement desire to have him, should kindly build a resolution never to have him, for truth it is that so in heart she loved him, as she could not find in her heart, he should be tied to what was unworthy of his presence. Argalus, with a most heavy heart, still pursuing his desire, she, fixed of mind to avoid further entreaty and to fly all company, which even of him grew unpleasant to her. One night she stole away, but with as yet it is unknown, or indeed what is become of her. Argalus sought her long, and in many places, at length despairing to find her, and the more he despaired, the more enraged, weary of his life, but first determining to be revenged of Demagoras, he went alone disguised into the chief town held by the Helots, where, coming into his presence, guarded about by many of his soldiers, he could delay his fury no longer for a fitter time, but setting upon him, in despite of a great many that helped him, gave him divers mortal wounds, and himself no question had been there presently murdered, but that Demagoras himself desired he might be kept alive, perchance with intention to feed his own eyes, with some cruel execution to be laid upon him. But death came sooner than he looked for, yet having had leisure to appoint his successor, a young man not long before delivered out of the prison of the king of Lacedaemon, where he should have suffered death, for having slain the king's nephew, but him he named, who at that time was absent making roads upon the Lacedaemonians, but being returned, the rest of the Helots, for the great liking they conceived of that young man, especially because they had none among themselves to whom the others would yield, were content to follow Demagoras's appointment. And well hath it succeeded with him, he having since done things beyond the hope of the youngest heads, of whom I speak the rather, because he hath hitherto preserved Argalus alive under pretence to have him publicly, and with exquisite torments, executed after the end of these wars, of which they hope for a soon and prosperous issue. And he hath likewise hitherto kept my young lord Clitophon alive, who, to redeem his friend, went with certain other noblemen of Laconia, and forces gathered by them, to besiege this young and new successor. But he, issuing out to the wonder of all men, defeated the Laconians, slew many of the noblemen, and took Clitophon prisoner. And now, sir, though to say the truth, we can promise ourselves little of their safeties while they are in the Helot's hands, I have delivered all I understand touching the loss of my lord's son and the cause thereof, which though it was not necessary to Clitophon's case to be so particularly told, yet the strangeness of it made me think it would not be unpleasant unto you. Palladius thanked him greatly for it, being even passionately delighted, with hearing so strange an accident of a knight so famous over the world as Argalus, with whom he had himself a long desire to meet, so had fame poured a noble emulation in him towards him. But then, well bethinking himself, he called for armour, desiring them to provide him a horse and guide, and armed, all saving the head, he went up to Calendar, whom he found lying upon the ground, having ever since banished both sleep and food, as enemies to the mourning which passion persuaded him was reasonable. But Palladius raised him up, saying unto him, No more, no more of this, my lord Calendar. Let us labour to find, before we lament the loss. You know myself, Miss Swan, who, though he be not my son, I would disdain the favour of life after him. But while there is hope left, let not the weakness of sorrow make the strength of it languish. Take comfort, and good success will follow. And with those words comfort seemed to lighten in his eyes, and that in his face and gesture was painted victory. Once Calendar's spirits were so revived with all that, receiving some sustenance and taking a little rest, he armed himself, and those few of his servants he had left unsent, and so himself guided Palladius to the place upon the frontiers, where already there were assembled, between three and four thousand men, all well disposed for Calendar's sake to abide any peril. But like men disused with a long peace, more determinate to do than skilful how to do, which Palladius soon perceiving, he desired to understand, as much as could be delivered unto him, the estate of the Helots. And he was answered by a man so well acquainted with the affairs of Laconia, that they were a kind of people who, having been of old freemen and possessioners, the Lacedaemonians had conquered them, and laid not only tribute but bondage upon them, 
which they had long borne, till of late the Lacedaemonians, through greediness growing more heavy than they could bear, and through contempt less careful how to make them bear, they had with a general consent, rather springing by the generalness of the cause than of any artificial practice, set themselves in arms, and wetting their courage with revenge, and grounding their resolution upon despair, they had proceeded with unlooked for success, having already taken diverse towns and castles, with the slaughter of many of the gentry, for whom no sex nor age could be accepted for an excuse, and that, although at the first they had fought rather with beastly fury than any soldierly discipline, practice had now made them comparable to the best of the Lacedaemonians, and more of late than ever. Palladius, having gotten his general knowledge of the party against whom, as he had already of the party for whom he was to fight, he went to Calendar and told him plainly that by plain force there was small appearance of helping Clitophon, but some device was to be taken in hand, wherein no less discretion than valour was to be used. Whereupon the council of the chief men was called, and at last this way Palladius, who by some experience, but especially by reading histories, was acquainted with stratagems, invented, and was by all the rest approved, that all the men there should dress themselves like the poorest sort of the people in Arcadia, having no banners, the bloody shirts hanged upon long staves, with some bad bagpipes instead of drum and fife, their armour they should, as well as might be, cover, or at least make them look so rustily and ill-favouredly, as might well become such wearers, and this the whole number should do, saving two hundred of the best chosen gentlemen for courage and strength, whereof Palladius himself would be one, who should have their arms chained and be put in carts like prisoners. This being performed according to the agreement, they marched on towards the town of Cardamilla, where Clitophon was captive, and being come two hours before sunset within view of the walls, the helots already descrying their number, and beginning to sound the alarm, they sent a cunning fellow, so much the cunninger, as that he could mask it under rudeness, who with such a kind of rhetoric as weeded out all flowers of rhetoric, delivered unto the helots assembled together that they were country people of Arcadia, no less oppressed by their lords, and no less desirous of liberty than they, and therefore had put themselves in the field, and had already, besides a great number slain, taken nine or ten score gentlemen prisoners, whom they had there well and fast chained. Now, because they had no strong retiring place in Arcadia, and were not yet of number enough to keep the field against their prince's forces, they were come to them for succour, knowing that daily more and more of their quality would flock unto them, but that in the meantime, lest their prince should pursue them, or the Lacedaemonian king and nobility, for the likeness of the cause, fall upon them, they desired that, if there were not room enough for them in the town, that yet they might encamp under the walls, and for surety have their prisoners, who were such men as were able to make their peace, kept within the town. The healers made but a short consultation, being glad that their contagion had spread itself into Arcadia, and making account that, if the peace did not fall out between them and their king, that it was the best way to set fire in all the parts of Greece, besides their greenness to have so many gentlemen in their hands, in whose ransoms they already meant to have a share, to which haste of concluding two things well helped. The one, that their captain, with the wisest of them, was at that time absent, about confirming or breaking the peace, with the state of Lacedaemon. The second, that ever many good fortunes began to breed a proud recklessness in them, therefore sending to view the camp, and finding that by their speech they were Arcadians, with whom they had had no war, never suspecting a private man's credit could have gathered such a force, and that all other tokens witnessed them to be of the lowest calling, besides the chains upon the gentlemen. They granted not only leave for the prisoners, but for some others of the company, and to all, that they might harbour under the walls. So opened they the gates, and received in the carts. Which being done, and Palladius seeing fit time, he gave the sign, and shaking off their chains, which were made with such art that, though they seemed most strong and fast, he that wear them might easily loose them, they drew their swords hidden in the carts, and so setting upon the ward, made them to fly either from the place or from their bodies, and so give entry to the Arcadians before the Helots could make any head to resist them. But the Helots, being men hardened against dangers, gathered as well as they could together in the market-place, and thence would have given a shrewd welcome to the Arcadians, but that Palladius, blaming those that were slow, heartening them that were forward, but especially with his own example leading them, made such an impression into the squadron of the Helots, that at first the great body of them, beginning to shake and stagger, at length every particular body recommended the protection of his life to his feet. Then Calendar cried to go to the prison where he thought his son was, but Palladius wished him first to house all the Helots and make themselves master of the gates. But ere that could be accomplished, the Helots had gotten new heart, and with divers sorts of shot, from corners of streets and house-windows, galled them, which courage was come unto them by the return of their captain, who, though he brought not many with him, having dispersed most of his companies to other of his holes, yet, meeting a great number running out of the gate not yet possessed by the Arcadians, he made them turn face, and with banners displayed, his trumpet give the loudest testimony he could of his return, 
which once heard the rest of the helots, which were otherwise scattered, bent thitherward with a new life of resolution, as if their captain had been a root out of which, as into branches, their courage had sprung. Then began the fight to grow most sharp, and the encounters of more cruel obstinacy, the Arcadians fighting to keep that that they had won, the helots to recover what they had lost, the Arcadians as in an unknown place, having no succour but in their hands, the helots as in their own place, fighting for their livings, wives, and children. There was victory and courage against revenge and despair, safety of both sides being no otherwise to be gotten but by destruction. At length the left wing of the Arcadians began to lose ground, which Palladius seeing, he straight thrust himself with his choice band against the throng that oppressed them, with such an overflowing of valour, that the captain of the Helots, whose eyes soon judge of that wherewith themselves were governed, saw that he alone was worth all the rest of the Arcadians, which he so wondered at, that it was hard to say whether he more liked his doings, or misliked the effects of his doings. But determining that upon that cast the game lay, and disdaining to fight with any other, he sought only to join with him, which mine was no less in Palladius, having easily marked that he was as the first mover of all the other hands. And so, their thoughts meeting in one point, they consented, though not agreed, to try each other's fortune, and so, joined themselves, to be the uttermost of the one side, they began a combat, which was so much inferior to the battle in noise and number, as it was surpassing it in bravery of fighting, and, as it were, delightful terribleness. Their courage was guided with skill, and their skill was armed with courage. Neither did their hardiness darken their wit, nor their wit cool their hardiness, both valiant as men despising death, both confident as unwonted to be overcome, yet doubtful by their present feeling, and respectful by what they had already seen, their feet steady, their hands diligent, their eyes watchful, and their hearts resolute. The parts either not armed or weakly armed were well known, and according to the knowledge should have been sharply visited, but that the answer was as quick as the objections. Yet some lighting, the smart bred rage, and the rage bred smart again, till, both sides beginning to wax faint, and rather desirous to die accompanied, than hopeful to live victorious, the captain of the Helots, with a blow whose violence grew of fury not of strength, or of strength proceeding of fury, straight Palladius upon the side of the head that he reeled as stoned, and withal the helmet fell off, he remaining bareheaded. But other of the Arcadians were ready to shield him from any harm by a tries of that nakedness, but little needed it, for his chief enemy, instead of pursuing that advantage, kneeled down, offering to deliver the pommel of his sword, in token of yielding, with all speaking aloud unto him, that he thought it more liberty to be his prisoner than any other's general. Palladius, standing upon himself, and misdoubting some craft, and the helots that were next their captain wavering, between looking for some stratagem or fearing treason. What, said the captain, hath Palladius forgotten the voice of Deiphantus? By that watchword Palladius knew that it was his only friend Pyrocles, whom he had lost upon the sea, and therefore both, most full of wonder so to be met, if they had not been full of joy than wonder, caused the retreat to be sounded, Deiphantus by authority and Palladius by persuasion, to which helped well the little advantage that was of either side and that of the helots party their captain's behaviour had made as many amazed as saw or heard of it and of the arcadian side the good old calendar striving more than his old age could achieve was newly taken prisoner but indeed the chief part of the fray was the knight which with her black arms pulled their malicious sights one from the other but he that took calendar meant nothing less than to save him but only so long as the captain might learn the enemy's secrets towards whom he led the old gentleman when he caused the retreat to be sounded looking for no other delivery from that captivity but by the painful taking away of all pain when whom should he see next to the captain with good tokens how valiantly he had fought that day against the arcadians but his son clitophon but now the captain had called all the principal helots to be assembled as well to deliberate what they had to do as to receive a message from the arcadians among whom palladius virtue besides the love calendar bare him having gotten principal authority he had persuaded them to seek rather by parley to recover the father and the son than by the sword, since the goodness of the captain assured him that way to speed, and his valour, wherewith he was of old acquainted, made him think any other way dangerous. This, therefore, was done in orderly manner, giving them to understand that, as they came but to deliver Clitophon, so offering to leave the footing they already had in the town, to go away without any further hurt, so as they might have the father and the son without ransom delivered, which conditions being heard and conceived by the helots, Deiphantus persuaded them without delay to accept them. The helots, as much moved by his authority as persuaded by his reasons, were content therewith, whereupon Palladius took order that the Arcadians should presently march out of the town, taking with them their prisoners, while the knight with mutual diffidence might keep them quiet, and ere day came they might be well on of their way, and so avoid those accidents which in late enemies a look, a word, or a particular man's quarrel might engender. This being on both sides concluded on, Calendar and Clitophon, who now with infinite joy, did know each other, came to kiss the hands and feet of Deiphantus, Clitophon telling his father how Deiphantus, not without danger to himself, 
had preserved him from the furious malice of the helots and even that day going to conclude the peace least in his absence he might receive some hurt he had taken him in his company and given him armour upon promise he should take the part of the helots which he had in this fight performed little knowing that it was against his father but said clitophon here is he who as a father hath new begotten me and as a god hath saved me from many deaths who already laid hold on me which calendar with tears of joy acknowledge beside his own deliverance only his benefit but daiphantus who loved doing well for itself and not for thanks break off those ceremonies desiring to know how palladius for so he called musidorus was come into that company and what his present estate was whereof receiving a brief declaration of calendar he sent him word by clitophon that he should not as now come unto him because he held himself not so sure a master of the helots minds that he would adventure him in their power who was so well known with an unfriendly acquaintance but that he desired him to return with calendar whither also he within few days having dispatched himself of the helots would repair calendar would needs kiss his hand again for that promise protesting he would esteem his house more blessed than a temple of the gods if it had once received him and then desiring pardon for argalus daiphantus assured them that he would die but he would bring him though till then kept in close prison indeed for his safety the helots being so animated against him as else he could not have lived and so taking their leave of him calendar clitophon palladius and the rest of the arcadians swearing that they would no further in any sort molest the helots they straightway marched out of the town carrying both their dead and wounded bodies with them and by morning were already within the limits of arcadia the helots of the other side shutting their gates gave themselves to bury their dead to cure their wounds and rest their wearied bodies till the next day bestowing the cheerful use of the light upon them daiphantus caused a general convocation to be made in the which he cheereth them for their escape from this recent gulf of danger and put straightly before them the happy terms he has obtained from the lacedaemonians next he telleth them that he shall leave them a motion to which the helots will not agree nor scarce hear but after much discourse they are brought to entertain on the condition that he will return should the lacedaemonians break this treaty and they need him end of book one part two